getting started introducing about Naaman. I want to begin tonight just looking again at those verses here we talked about in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Uh, have that up there. Uh, on the screen, I believe that's uh, New King James Version. Uh, now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Uh, this is probably one of the more uh, interesting stories, at least to me, in all of the Old Testament. And there's a lot of things about this that, that we can learn from it. We kind of mentioned last week about this idea of, you know, you look at that this man, Naaman, and all that the text says about him, uh, you know, and you're just saying, Boy, this man has been blessed in just about any way he could want. Uh, he is the commander of the army of Syria. So he's in a position of great authority. Uh, he's in a position also of power that he has there because of that, being in that. He's also in, in high favor with his master. Uh, and there are reasons why his master favors him so much. And that is because, as the text point out here, the fact that he had uh, given victory to Syria. Now, that was by, you know, God's help. He had done that. But he also, he was a mighty man of valor. Uh, he, was, he was a mighty man. He was known for his abilities in leading an army. Uh, but a mighty man of valor. A man of great personal courage. Uh, it's not just the courage to send others into battle, but the courage to go into battle himself. Uh, that's the type of thing you look at. You know, what, what a man... Uh, how great he was and how blessed he is. But then there's that little word there, but. And the text adds, but he was a leper. Now, the great resume that he has of his life is suddenly brought to nothing because of the fact that he has this disease of leprosy. Uh, what does it mean to be a leper in those days? You know, number one, you're an outcast. Uh, that this particular type of leprosy that he had, uh, it, it could be communicated, it could be passed on to others, but not just by casual uh, touch or anything, but still it was. And because of that, they were kept as outcasts. And in the law of God, those that had this disease, leprosy, had to be put outside the camp. And, and you remember the instructions were given that if anyone come near them, they were to cup their hands around their mouth and cry out what? Unclean. To let them, now, even, even if it wasn't the deadly cancer of uh, uh, leprosy here, Hansen's disease, if it wasn't that, it was just any outbreak on the body that sometimes the same word is used, uh, psoriasis or whatever. whatever. If something like that made them unclean, and if you touched them, you became unclean. And so that's why they would cry out that to keep anybody from getting too close to them. But if we're talking about a deadly disease, and I believe that what... Naaman has here is that deadly disease, then you don't want to have contact with anybody else unless you transmit that disease to them. Uh, and they become the ones inflicted by that. And so here's that man who, who has all these great qualities he has, but the text says he, he is a leper. Uh, now the leprosy that we're talking about here, uh, in, in looking to different books about it and, and the dictionary Bible dictionaries that talk about it uh, one of the things they talk about when it began on the body it might begin as, as small uh, dots kind of like freckles on you uh, but over time that gradually is going to turn into nodules now some of these forms of leprosy were such that, that the nodules that would form especially like on the fingers and so forth uh, and eventually what would happen is the fingers would begin to fall off a joint at a time. Uh, same thing, you know, with the nose. You might lose your nose, your ears. And so it's not unusual. I, I opted not to put the pictures up this time. I've done that before. But you see people that have that type of leprosy, you know, 
no nose, no ears, no fingers, uh, because of the, the effect that this disease has on them. And it's a horrible thing to have something like that. It, it's a slow and agonizing death. And when I say agonizing, not, not necessarily from the pain, because a lot of this, uh, at least in, in one book that I was reading about it, uh, said that this form of, of uh, leprosy is attended with uh, uh, anesthesia. Now, we think about that as putting somebody to sleep so they don't feel pain in surgery. But that's what they're talking about here. Uh, you will not necessarily have that pain. You know, I was just like, boy, if you start having your fingers fall off, you know, but there's no pain involved in that. But it's agonizing because, it, it, you know, the effect that it has on you and others and your appearance and what other people are going to think about you and how it isolates you from others and also the fact that you know it's just a gradual death that's coming. And so it's a horrible thing to have something like it. And, and that's the problem here with this man. He has uh, that disease. And like we said, its certain end is death. Unless God intervenes, there was no hope for these people of being able to survive that disease. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, so far, two things about this. So far as we know, first of all, Syria did not recognize the laws that Israel was given to God to keep separated from anybody uh, to avoid its being spread. Uh, and so that, that would keep him there. And, you know, we don't know how far along he is in this disease. Uh, you know, it, it may not have got to that point where he's starting to lose digits and everything. Right, and uh, well, I don't know. Uh, uh, we do know that, that the Jews knew about it, and then they were kept. That's why God gave those, them the strict laws about it. But you think about this man having that, you know, and just you know, we, we all know we're going to die. But when you've got something like this, you know, it's coming. And the thing about it is, it, it's going to be one of those diseases where you know, people are going to withdraw from you. You know, they just it, it's hard uh, for some people to be around someone in, in that situation. The, the horror of seeing what they're going through and doing that. And yet, that's, that's the situation here with this man. He has this disease, and he doesn't know what to do about it. And yet, uh, there's a young Israelite maid. Uh, she is serving uh, Naaman's wife. Now, how did she get to be a servant or a slave? She's been captured. You know, uh, we, we're going to talk about this a little bit later too, about, but the, the Syrian army, bands of them, you know, not, not huge armies, but groups of them would go out in raids into Israel and take whatever they could. And every day on one of these raids, this young woman's been captured and she's been made a slave of them. Now, ask yourself the question, if you had been captured and made a slave uh, of somebody that's, that's been raiding against your nation for a long period of time and you've been captured... Uh, and then you learn that the man head of that whole army has got leprosy. How would you feel about that? Be honest. Yeah, wouldn't care. Yeah, you, karma, you know, you're getting even for all the evil you've done. It's come on you now. And most people, you know, would have that attitude, you know, uh, well, you've got what you deserve. You know, and I'm, I'm glad you've got it. But that's not the attitude that this young woman has. And, and I really like, you know, Brother Burton Kaufman talked about it. He said, when you read this story, he said, the real hero of this story is this young Jewish girl who's been captured and brought in that. And, and her attitude, though, toward her master, the one that's captured her, is to, is to say to his wife, you know, I wish my master was with that prophet in Israel for he would heal him of this disease. You know, she's given him the only hope he has, the only way out of the situation he's in. She's given him the only hope for getting rid of that disease, that if he could only be with the prophet of God there, then he could be, you know, healed of that disease. And, and you just think, you know, that's her attitude toward her enemy. You know, that she's wishing well for him, and she would like to see him be healed so 
you know, that's got to have an impact, I would think, upon Naaman and his wife and others who know this, what's going on here. And I think, you know, if we could have that kind of attitude ourselves in life, if, if our feelings toward everybody, even those that we might consider enemies of ourselves, even those people maybe that don't care about us, maybe they don't care about Christianity and those who are following Christ, you know, but if we could have that attitude toward them, my desire is that they could come to know Christ so that they could be healed of their disease of sin and, and they could be made right with God and, and they could be saved. And that's kind of the attitude that this young woman has here toward him. She's concerned about him, and she wants him to be able to that. Uh, she wants ma her master neighbor. Even though he is an enemy to the Israelite nation, he's one responsible for her now being a slave. She's concerned enough about him that she wants to be able to get that help for him. Uh, but though Naaman is a great man, one of the things we talked about is there are a number of mistakes that Naaman made in his life at this time. And, and, and we need to learn to, to, to learn from those mistakes. I don't know about you, but I, I've heard people say things like, you know, well, I've got to learn it for myself. Okay? Uh, warnings from mom and dad about certain things doesn't mean anything. I'm going to have to learn it for myself. Or, the, or to talk to somebody else and say, they are so hard-headed. The only way they're going to learn it is they have to experience it themselves, and then they'll know. But the reality is, we don't have to learn it the hard way. We can learn it from the mistakes of other people. And, and if we look at the mistakes that Naaman is making, we don't have to make those mistakes. We can learn from what he has done and learn to avoid that and to do what, what God would have us to do and to be what God wants us to be. Now, the first mistake that I want to notice is, was Naaman thought that his healing could be purchased. Now, Naaman, I, I don't know so much that Naaman made this mistake, maybe as much as the king of Syria did. When, when Naaman hears what this young girl says, where does he go? He goes to his king and tells him about this one in Israel, according to this young woman, would be able to heal him. And so... What happens is the king gives Naaman a great deal of wealth. If you look there at all that he's given, uh, this is down to about verse 6. Uh, ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten festal garments. Uh, and he told him, you take these, and I'm going to send you to the king of Israel and uh, you know, for the healing you need. Well... I think a couple of things. Number one, I think, again, that shows something how much the king of Syria loved and respected his leader, Naaman. Uh, have you ever thought about the amount of money that, that's involved in there? Uh, look at it again. It says, first of all, ten talents of silver. Uh, silver, uh, well, first of all, the talent was about 75 pounds. So we're looking at 750 pounds of silver. Silver, when I looked the other day on the Internet, silver was something like $17.25 an ounce. So I think that was, that was a little over $200,000 or $300,000 in silver. Then there were 6,000... Uh, let me make sure that's right. Yeah, yeah 6,000 shekels of gold. Now this like to drove me crazy. Uh, I looked up the word shekel in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. And, and the word shekel, it says, was a coin. But uh, when it was used of gold, they've never found gold shekels. So they figured then the shekel was representative not of a coin, but simply of a weight. And uh, they believed the Babylonian shekel was something like uh, 424 grains. How many know what a grain, how much a grain weighs? 7,000 in a pound? Uh, I, I forgot. I had to look it up. But it took me a long time to find anything that would tell me about it. But figuring out how much it was, uh, you'd get about uh, 
I think it was about a half of ounce for a shekel. But 6,000 shekels, you're looking at 3,000 ounces. You want to guess what gold is worth today? Or at least what it was worth yesterday on the market? Yeah, it was $1,229. So you multiply that by $3,000. you are we looking at something in our money today would have been about $4.4 billion. I just throw in the 10 garments for free. $4.4 billion. Now, healing of leprosy is a great, great blessing. And you've got to figure a great blessing is going to cost you a lot of money. And so that's why the king gives him all of this wealth to go and get the healing you need. You know, if you've got that ability to cure somebody of leprosy, you know, people complain in our country today about what pharmaceutical companies will charge for uh, medicine that, that they make. You know, well, if you've got something, if you found something that would cure cancer, it would cure any form of cancer whatsoever. You know, if you wanted to be selfish with it, you would find people who are willing to pay you all the money they've got. Uh, in our country, there, there's only a few people that could spend $4.4 billion, uh, but there are those who could do it. And evidently, the king of Syria, he had that kind of money. I mean, this was nothing to him. that He could afford that. And that's what he's offering to him. But the problem is you can't buy you know, this healing from God. We need to, to realize and learn from the mistake he made. You can't buy that healing. It, it was a gift from God to him. And, and when he offers that money uh, to the prophet Elisha, what did Elisha do? Yeah, well, yeah but he refused to accept the money. for the he, he wouldn't do it. Even though Naaman urged him, you know, he didn't just say, hey, here, take this. And, and, then, and then Elisha says, no. And he said, well, okay. No, he urged him. He kept on trying to get him to take that money, and he wouldn't do it. Because Elisha knew that wasn't the will of God. When our Lord uh, sent the disciples out, uh, when he sent them out first of all on the limited commission, and then again it'll occur later. Uh, let's see if I put that down here. hoping I had that verse here. All right, yeah, let's go here. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We need to realize we have the sin in our lives. And only God can heal us of that. Only God can wash away our sins. Only God can forgive sins. And uh, so you think, man, that's, that's going to be... Mighty expensive gift. Well, it cost God dearly. It cost Him His Son. But it doesn't cost us anything. You know, God doesn't, doesn't require that. Paul says that the wages of sin, what you and I have earned by our sin in life, we've earned death. But now salvation is a gift. It's not something we've earned. It's a gift that comes to us from God. And when Paul talked about it in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Uh, we don't have enough money to purchase salvation from God because it cannot be purchased. That's not the way it's done. It's a gift from God to those who will be obedient to Him. Now, when Jesus sent the disciples out, do you remember what He told them? When you go out and you heal, He mentioned my mother, you heal the lepers the lame, you know, you do that. And he says, freely you have received, what? Freely give. So, you know, those disciples knew, we, we've got an ability to provide for these people something that nobody else can provide. We can provide them healing from such dread diseases as leprosy. But we're not going to charge them for it because Jesus said, you freely receive, you freely give. And so, this man thinks, well, that's the only way you can get the cure for leprosy. I'm going to have to pay for it. But God doesn't want that. And there's no way that we can purchase our salvation. There's no amount of money to do that. 
Now, that's not what God has offered. It's a gift He comes to us. Mistake number two that He made. He went to the wrong place because initially, where did He go? First of all, He went to the king of Syria. The king of Syria gave Him all this money. And then, where did He go with that money? He went to the king of Israel. Uh, what did the king say to him? you remember? Right. The king of Israel told his people, look what this man is doing. He's trying to, to, to egg me on into war, wanting me to help. And, and the words that he used of it when he talked about there was, he said, am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? As far as the king of Israel was concerned, leprosy was a matter of life and death. He has sent this man to me. Am I God to kill and to make alive? He understood only God could heal this leprosy. Yeah, they, they had... <laughs> well, that's what Gehazi, I think, that's one of the reasons why he had his, his attitude. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, he thought that's what he was trying to do, stir up a war. He, 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 well, he knows God can heal it, but he doesn't know that that's the right. And, uh, you know, it just, it's amazing to me when you look at all these things that are happening, what's going on. Uh, you know, I just think that the king of, of Assyria, when he heard about it, thought, well, if they're going to heal leprosy, if he can do that, it ain't going to come cheap. And so I think that's why he was willing to give all that money. Yeah. yeah. Right. Now, and we're going to see more about that too. Just but yes, sir. Well, it could be. You know, uh, I'm the king of, of Syria that's invading their country. This is my commander. You know. Maybe Elijah would not be very receptive toward them. But if it goes through the king of Israel, maybe he might be more receptive. So, you know, but, but we know that that's not the place where he's going to find the healing. He's going to have to go to that prophet. You know, somewhere along the line, something got mixed up. Because remember the young lady, the young Jewish girl had been captured. She said, I wish that my master were with a prophet in Israel, that he might be healed. And somehow or another, that got lost. And instead of going to the prophet, he goes to the king of, of uh, Syria, who sends him then to the king of Israel. You know, uh, maybe figuring, hey, you know, they're the kings, they're the ones in authority, maybe they're the ones that can get Elisha uh, to do this. I, I don't know what it is. But yeah, it's going to the wrong place. And that's when, you know, the king of Israel just gets aggravated and gets uh, angry. In fact, the text, I believe, says that... Uh, well, no, that comes a little bit later. But, you know, he, he thinks this is an effort to start a war with him because he doesn't have the ability to heal. So that's the mistake he made. And we, sometimes, you know, we've got to be careful that we don't go to the wrong place for our salvation. And I say that because sometimes people uh, go to the Old Testament for their salvation. Uh, I've studied with people at different times, and you have too, uh, that have told me that if you just keep the Ten Commandments, that you'll be saved. And I've gotten into long discussions with people, and nothing seems to be able to persuade them. You know, just keep the Ten Commandments, and, and that's it. And, and that's where you're going to have salvation. Uh, but that's not where you're going to find salvation. Salvation is in Christ, and it's only in Him. And so we've got to make sure that's who we go to for the salvation we need. Uh, mistake number three that he made, well, that's... Just the more verses, I forgot to put those on here. 
Uh, this is when John saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's the only one that can uh, save us from our sins. The only one that can be able to provide that for us. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so salvation is not going to be found anywhere else except in Christ. Uh, mistake number three, Naaman wanted to be healed in his own way. Uh, Naaman was like a lot of people, uh, maybe like some of us. and He had his own idea of how he would be healed. Uh, when, when he comes to Elisha, uh, he comes to the door. Elisha doesn't even come out. Elisha sends his servant out. And, and the servant tells him, you go down to the Jordan River and dip in it seven times, and your flesh will come back as a little child. Evidently, you know, looking at his skin, you could begin to see the effects of that leprosy. But once you do what I'm saying, you dip seven times in the Jordan River, your, your flesh is going to come back on you like, like that of a child. And, and he can have that done for him. But uh, Naaman became angry. You know, the Bible talks about how that Naaman was furious. Why? What's that? Yeah, he, he thought, hey, why doesn't the prophet come out to me? That's what I thought. Behold, I thought he'd come out to me, you know, and he... Right, yeah. And he'll, he'll wave his hand over the leper, and, and I'll be healed. And, uh, and so he was furious about it, you know, uh, when he was told to do this. Uh, let's see. That's verse 11. Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Uh, preconceived ideas about how God is going to save someone. We need to be careful about that. Uh, sometimes we get it in our own mind, first of all, you know, what God's going to do, and then we search the Bible to find that. And if that's the attitude you have, too many times you're going to find, or at least you think you're going to find, that very thing. We need to look to God first of all and see what it is that God wants us to do and not allow ourselves to get caught up in that. Uh, but now, he, he, so he's angry. And what did his servant tell him? Because I think this is important. Did I see somebody have a hand up over here? Did, Remember remember when Miriam was stricken with leprosy and what was Moses' words to God? Heal her now. Uh, and so that, that is the case. Too many times we want a quick fix and so we want it to be the way we want. So, but Naaman goes away and he's angry and his servant came up to him. And I, I've just recently begun to recognize how many times the servants of these people have shown much greater wisdom than their masters. It was a servant girl that told him about Elisha. Now it's his own servant that comes to him, and what did he tell him? Yeah. Master, if he had bid you do some great thing, would you not have done it? Now why would that be the case? Huh? He would. Why would he have done it if it had been something great pride I think that goes with it a lot you know uh, just to think you know I can do something that nobody else could do you know now if if Elijah had said well you know I'm going to need the equivalent of 4.4 .4 billion dollars I got it I got you covered Elijah I got it right here with me nobody else could have done that but me and he would have gladly done that but, you know, his servant reasons with him. How much better that he had said to you simply to go dip, you know, and be healed. Uh, and what God requires of us is, is not some great thing. I wonder sometimes if that's why the rich and the powerful 
are not so eager to, to, to listen to the gospel and to obey it. You know, and I, I wonder if they don't have that in their own mind too. You know, and if I'd been, if God had asked me to do some great thing, you know, that only me and two or three others might could have done, I would have done it. But to do something so simple as to dip in the river seven times and to be healed. And, and what God has asked us to do is something anybody can do. You know, I, I'm grateful that God didn't say, you know, you've got to give at least a million dollars to the church. I'd be without hope. I, I'm glad he didn't say, you know, I'm going to require, you're going to have to baptize at least 10,000 people every year. Uh, it's kind of difficult, isn't it? But he doesn't require that. It's such simple things that he's required us to do uh, in order that we might be saved. Uh, number four, and this ties in with it, uh, Naaman wanted to substitute. So when he's told to go dip seven times in the Jordan River, what was his complaint about the Jordan River? It's a dirty river. It's muddy, you know. And, and what about the rivers back at home? They're clean sparkling, clear waters. You know, are we ever prejudiced toward our own country? <laughs> you know, uh, here I am in this, this and some people would call it a God-forsaken land of Israel, you know, and, and what it's like. Yeah. You know, so just think about that, though. Now, his thoughts is, Let's, let's make it a river contest, okay? And the rivers back home are much better than rivers here in Israel. So why can't I just go over there and dip seven times and be healed? Uh, you need to be careful sometimes. People want to make salvation a church deal. Well, my church is just as good as yours, you know? Well, it's not a church contest. It's a contest of simply doing what God tells you to do. And, and that's what the servant is telling him. You know, he's asked you to do something simple. Why not do it? And so he finally consents to it, and he goes down to the Jordan River, and he dips down at one time as he comes up, and I'm sure he's looking. And there's no change. It's still there. He dips a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time, and it's still there. And he goes down that seventh time, and he comes up, and his skin is like that of a new child. I mean, it's just... It's all perfect. It's back the way it, it was. The leprosy's gone. Now, question. I think I put that up here. Did the waters of the Jordan heal him? No. Absolutely not. It, it was his obedience to God that brought it out. Now, how do we know that the waters of the Jordan didn't heal him? Look what Jesus said, Luke 4, 27. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. What do you think word was, what happened when word got out? That this man with lepers has gone, and he's dipped seven times in the Jordan River, and he was healed. What do you think the lepers in Israel are going to do? They're going to beat a path to the Jordan River. You know? If somebody talks about something they did that, that healed them or whatever, then everybody wants to try it. But Jesus said none of the others were ever healed. If they did, if all the other lepers went down to the Jordan River and jumped in there, none of them were healed. Because that's not where the power to heal is at. It's not in the Jordan River. It's in God. The same thing is true with baptism. The power to, to, to heal is not in that baptistry. You know, if you go up there and look at that baptistry and look down at that water... That water's not a bit different from any other water in the world. It comes out of the tap just like the water you drink at home. Uh, so there's nothing special about it. It's not a holy water. And, and it's not that water that's going to heal. It's not that water that's going to save. It's simply, it's an act of obedience that God has commanded of us. And when we do that, then we're going to be saved. Not because there's power in that water, but simply because God has commanded us to do that. And he has set that as the time when he's going to remove sin. There was no power in the Jordan River and that water to heal leprosy. 
But God just chose that as the time when he would heal the leprosy of Naaman, when he showed his obedience to God and his willingness to go down seven times into that river. And when he did that, he was healed. And so that, that to me, that's a powerful lesson also for, for us today to, to understand and look at. Now, the last thing, I'm going to have time to get through all this, but is it a time? This, this is a question that Elisha asked of Gehazi. Gehazi was his servant. When, when uh, Naaman is healed and, and he's returning and he's carrying with him all that silver, gold, and those ten changes of garment he had with him, not a bit of it remained high, behind with Elisha. He's going to be just as wealthy going back as he was when he came, plus he's been healed. Gehazi, for some reason, is just not willing to accept that. It may be, I don't know if that's his hatred toward the Gentiles and toward the fact that these were enemies of, of Israel, or whether he was just covetous of that wealth. So he runs after Naaman. And, and, and when Naaman sees him, Naaman stops and gets out and, and meets him, and uh, he lies to him. He says to Naaman, two, you know, sons of the prophets have come by. And, and uh, so Elisha had decided, you know, that if you would give them a, uh, a talent of silver and, uh, and a change of garment. And so Naaman says, take two talents. And take these two changes of garment. And he even gives somebody to help carry it for him. Then he gets back, and then he takes the things and lets the servant go back. <coughs> what did he do with that wealth that he got from him? He hid it. He went back and hid it. Now, who else do you know of in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that got aching, that got gold that he wasn't supposed to get, went and hid it in his tent so nobody would know about it. Well, God knew about it, and God revealed it. Now, here's Gehazi, he comes back. And when he comes in, Elisha says to him, Where have you been? He said, Your servant's been nowhere. And Elisha said, Did I not go with you when the man stopped his chariot and turned back to speak with you? <coughs> He knows. He was there. And so Gehazi, is it a time? <coughs> and that's the question he begins asking. That's where we'll begin, Lord willing, next week to talk about that and what's involved in that and what happens to Gehazi. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's close with a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Father, once more we thank Thee for allowing us the opportunity to be here. Help us, Father, to do our very best in studying Your Word, to look, to find what it is that you want us to do and what we need to learn from these passages from the Old Testament. Help us all to be strengthened by it and help us, Father, to be more determined in our life to live for thee in all righteousness. Dismiss us in your care and please bring us back again at the next appointed time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.